friends. Welcome back, everybody. I'm T.S., and the color cast is on the air now from CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. It is Tuesday night, the 21st of July, 1998, and rock star Rick James is back with us tonight. And the story of Lisa Michaels, she'll tell it herself, a very unusual upbringing in the 1960s and 1970s, and, of course, the magic of you on the toll-free highway. I had an email today from a viewer who said, you know, you haven't talked about Mother Snyder lately. Is she okay? And the answer is she's just fine, thank you. In fact, I went to see her today, and we paid another visit to the drive through car wash. Remember the last time we went down there, she says, man, it weather sure has changed. <laughs> you know, the water hits the car, right? You know, the king of all late night in the drive through car wash. Yeah. <laughs> Wonder what the king is doing today? drive through car wash with Mother Snyder. So anyway, I pick her up. I says, Mom, why don't we take a little ride? I have to gas the car and get it cleaned up. And she said, fine, I'd love to go out. And she was in great shape today. So we drive down the hill and we go to this, uh, it's called the bubble machine. All right. And uh, we get in the car wash and she says, you know, every time we come down here, it's pouring. <laughs> so we went back to, the, uh, to, uh, to, to her residence, uh, Mary Crest Manor there in Culver City. And Gladys and her magic violin were in attendance today. Tuesday is Gladys and her magic violin. And she's so sweet. I mean, she plays all the songs that all the ladies love, and they sing along, and they have a great time, and she takes requests. And Mother always has one. So after the whole thing is over, she introduces me to Gladys and the magic violin. And there's a new nun there who's in charge. I call her sister in charge. And I introduced myself, and once again, making a complete fool of myself, I said, by the way, I'm Tom Snyder's mother. I meant to say that, you know, <laughs> that, that, that I'm Mrs. Snyder's son, but I said, I'm Tom Snyder's mother. And she looked at me, she says, are, are you okay? I said, yeah. I said, every time I see the, the magic violin, I go a little crazy. But, <laughs> but it was a great day, and I thank you for asking, and she was in great, great form today. Uh, little Johnny missed his final exam, because the master of the... Beautiful. Prince of Blends. Prince of Blends, right. <laughs> King of all late night, Prince of Blends. Uh, little Johnny had missed his final exam. He, uh, he had the flu. But he had done so well during the year that his teacher suggested to the school principal they give him an oral exam to make up for the test he missed. And the principal agreed, so they called little Johnny to the office and explained to him what they were going to do. And the teacher said, Johnny, what does a cow have four of that I only have two of? Little Johnny thought for a second, and he said, legs. And the teacher said, Johnny, what do you have in your pants that I don't have in my pants? And Johnny thought for a second, he said, pockets. And the teacher asked, Johnny, what's the capital of Italy? And little Johnny said, Rome. Teacher turned to the principal, says, did he pass? Principal says, don't ask me, I got the first two wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Rick James is here tonight, and Lisa Michaels, and, and you on the toll-free. I'm Tom. You're watching CBS. Fire up the color teenies and catch the pictures now as we fly them through the air. <laughs> The singer Rick James was the heart and soul of funk during the 1980s before he weathered the personal turmoil of prison and drug addiction. He now has his life and career back on track. His first recording since 1988 called Urban Rhapsody is out now. And next year, Rick publishes his autobiography called Confessions of a Super Freak. It's great to welcome you back to CBS, and thank you for joining us again. It's really a pleasure to see you. You look terrific. You thank you for having me, Tom. You, you've thank lost you weight since you were here. You look fabulous. You, you can really tell. Are. Thanks. Yeah. I'm glad somebody's yeah. noticed. Yeah, you look terrific. Yeah. Now, you know, we talked the last time here about your, your tour of duty, as it were, at Folsom Prison. Yeah. And then I, I want to ask you here, when you, when you went back on stage the first time after you served your time in prison, what was that experience like for you? Well, fortunately, um, when I went on stage, it was in Los Angeles. And fortunately, again, when I went on stage, it was a place called the House of Blues, oh, sure. which we played right before the tour. Right. And unfortunately, I was very, 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 very nervous. I, I think I was more nervous than I had ever been in my life. Really? I, I mean, considering all the times that you performed before huge audiences. Yeah, I mean, it, we're talking about 20, 30 years of, of touring. and. Um, it was terrible. I mean, I just, I just had this, this stomach that wouldn't relax, and I was tense, right. and, and. Uh, but do you think, the, do you think the crowd could tell? No, well, you know, I mean, this was actually backstage. Oh, I mean, okay. this was before I went on. You know, I mean, uh, God, I hadn't played in front of a crowd in, in um, over 15 years. You know, and um, I was bent, you know, to say the least. You know, and I, and I, and I couldn't just go. 
usually cases like that, I take me some cocaine or something, and I, I you know, in the old days, and I numb <laughs> the feelings, and I go up, pop, hey, you know, and, uh, half a bottle of Jack Black and some Cavassier, and uh, you know, half an ounce of coke, and I was ready, just leveled it out, right? But this time it wasn't any of that, you know. And uh, I remember being in my dressing room, and Chris Tucker, a uh, fine young actor and comedian, uh, he came to the show, and he was upstairs, you know, he was up in the dressing room trying to get me a. Uh, cooled me out and uh, another guy named Paul Mooney and Eddie Griffin. So I had these three comedians there who were like, who kept me like really laughing and kept me, they're the ones who brought me on. And I just remember stepping out there and it was, after I got out there, Tom, it was cool. It was like, like old nothing times, had changed. Yeah, yeah. It was like nothing had changed. And I was a little overweight, I felt, you know, and um, I hadn't had my hip surgery yet. So I was still feeling a lot of pain on that. But, you know, it's funny how, you know, God gives you this thing, and, and then when it's time to do it, nothing stops you, you know? All the adrenaline gets going, and yeah, out you go. It's kind of like the mailman. Music you know? starts to play, and yeah. you're with it. That's terrific. Yeah, and it's just, um, it was like old times. And, and it was filled with a lot of entertainers and, and stars and celebrities, and they all made me feel wonderful. That's terrific. Now, let me ask you here, what was wrong with your hip? I don't think we talked about that the last time. I had a hip surgery. I had a hip replacement in February. You know, what what'd you do to it? Oh, uh, it, it was nothing. It didn't have anything to do with drugs. It didn't have anything to do with alcohol or anything like that. It was just years of wear and tear using my right leg. You know, I like to, when I'm on stage, you know, you get a lot of that gyrating stuff going on. You know, a lot right, of that sure. stuff hurts the hip, you know? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> kicking, you know, I used to kick a lot. Matter of fact, the doctors were calling it rock and roll hip because uh, I think one of the Van Halen brothers, Eddie or his brother, one of them had it and some other rock and rollers yeah, that I know yeah. well had replacement. So it's just uh, you know, it's a common thing right now. And also, since we saw you the last time, Rick, you've been on this tour, your first tour since yeah. you've been back. And I remember uh, you saying that the, that was it the parole board had to approve the, the locations that you went to? Well, no, they didn't approve the locations, but they, they had to approve me every week that I went out. Right, I leaving the, tour the state was of for California. Like almost six months. Right. And uh, what would happen is after the, the parole board were wonderful about the whole thing. You know, they, uh, they just wanted to make sure that I was going to have my head together, right. you know, and that I wasn't going to be out there using cocaine and all that kind of stuff, you know. And, and I can understand that, you know, that's natural. Uh, all my life I've done it, so why change? Yeah. Now, how about you and cocaine? Is that finished now? Yeah. Yeah. Did you go to a program or do it yourself? How did, how did you No, I mean, I, I, don't think, I don't think there's a such thing as, as, as doing it yourself. I mean, ending it yourself. You always need support. And you always need the help of others, you know. Thank God I have a strong support group, you know. I have uh, friends and uh, band members and, and associates. And, you know, and, and, you know, there's, and a doctor, you know. I was under doctor's care for okay. uh, about six months after I got out. And he gave me a lot of help. But, but basically it was friends and, and family, you know. I mean, don't get me wrong, Tom. There's always a thing in the back of your mind sometimes you want to do it. I mean, I wake up in the morning and it's sunny and nice and, oh, it's, I think I'll do some cocaine. You know, it's really? nice. You know, it'll be raining. Oh, I think I'll do some cocaine. You know, whatever. You know, anything, anything can spark it. How how addictive uh, is, is is that drug? You know, I dabbled with marijuana back in the '70s and early '80s. And but I, but, but I and hello and, and I but I, and, I never, I never went to. Oh, wait a minute. I never went Tom, to. Tom, I'm not hearing you. <laughs> what are we? We dabbled with marijuana. Yeah, is that we what did. Yeah, we dabbled. With what else did we? Dabble we with. didn't dabble with anything else. We never had the urge. I like the way he looks over when he says, it. "We didn't dabble with anything else, Rick. We just." Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever known anyone just to dabble with marijuana. All right, I used it, okay? Oh, okay, there we go. All right. Smoke the hell out of Smoke it. Smoke the hell out of yeah. it. Damn right. Okay. No, I, it, um, cocaine is, is, is a funny drug because when I was, uh, let me tell you a little short story. When, yeah, we, when me and my band, the Stone City Band, were together, every album we made for the 15 or 17 years that we were making albums, and I'm talking about albums that sold millions of copies, every album we did, we never failed to have an ounce or two sitting right there on the console. Really? A big bag of Quaaludes, okay? Uh, Crystal Champagne and Jack Black bourbon and, you know, all at our, all at our uh, beck and command right there. I don't think I've ever made an album other than for the last few years that didn't have cocaine. And I was snorting it. And we'd stay up for weeks making these albums. And we were doing like three or four albums a year. I was doing myself. I was doing Tina Marie. I was doing the Mary Jane Girls. I was doing the Stone City Band. Uh, I did Eddie Murphy under, under the same See, kind See, what of I can't lunch. figure out. You know, but my point is, okay. when I stopped snorting and started smoking, then that's when my addiction skyrocketed. Because after you have that first hit of cocaine, it's nothing has, it's so, it's like 
a million to the difference is astronomical compared to snorting. I mean, there was there wasn't a rush in the world that I had ever had in my life, other than maybe sexually or something. What I can't understand is how you can work when you're stoned, because having been stoned, I knew when I was in that in that condition after smoking dope. I couldn't come in and do a show or, or, or do a newscast. Well, marijuana was easy. I mean, we did marijuana. We woke up in the morning. We called it Mary Jane. We wrote a national song about it. You know, I love you, Mary Jane, that kind of thing. And, you know, we, we smoked all the time. We never really thought about it. And I think one of the ways we were able to make so many albums off it, because the whole band did it. Everybody but maybe one guy in the band. The whole band did it. And we were all in accord with one another. Right, so everybody's on the same wavelength. Everybody was on the same plane. I mean, everybody was snorting and everybody was creating and everybody was singing. But, and this went on for 15 years, us making albums like this, you know, like before we went on stage, mm -hmm. after we went on stage, during the making of the albums. Then about 15 years later, 17 years later, one day we sat and we had a one and one in the studio and the whole dimension changed. It was like we couldn't make an album. I couldn't sit and make an album mm -hmm. anymore. It's a very strange thing. I think I have to ask my doctor why is that. Yeah, ask him. Find, oh, find out. I find out. Let me take a fast break. We're talking with Rick James. Uh, his newest CD is called Urban Rhapsody. The book's still to come, Confessions of a Super Freak. Back with Rick and you on the toll-free as time permits after these messages. <laughs> Uh, with Rick James, here is James calling on the toll-free in Springfield, Illinois. Hello there. No, Springfield, Missouri. Springfield, Missouri. My mistake. Hi, James. How are you? Hi, Tom. I wanted to ask Rick. I saw a documentary on VH1 about him. And I, wanted, I know he was close to his mom, and I want to ask him what is the funniest, greatest story about his mother. You know, I really... I, I, uh, I have so many stories about my mother that were hilarious. Uh, I mean, real When, when, when my really. band, I'll tell you one quick funny story. When my band was staying at my house, uh, they were staying, I had a bunch of members in my group staying at my house, and I lived in Orchard Park, and I had this indoor swimming pool and these horses, and I just wanted a bunch of people on. When, when my mother really thought that uh, she didn't understand the concept of a band staying with, with one another, so she, one day she decided she got really upset, and she wanted everybody out, so of course nobody left. So she came down, she came down with a shotgun. <laughs> oh, come on. And she stood in my door and says, I want everybody's using my son. <laughs> I want everybody out of there. And I came out, and I'm like, got a robe on, and she's standing there. I kill everybody. I kill them all. I said, Mom, these are my band. They live here. Hello. Uh, <laughs> this is, you know, it's, I've got so many stories with uh, mom my mother. Didn't, mom took no guff from you growing my up. My mother didn't take nothing. If she thought, my mother raised eight kids on her own through the numbers rackets, and what you know about that, right? Right. And she wasn't, she was all about anybody put it, lay a hand on my children, and they die. So she really thought, in that particular instance that I just told, she really she, thought what, I was what, being what, used. Was she tough on your brothers and sisters? I mean, what? she was tough on all of us, basically. I mean, basically, I mean, did, did, did she whack you if you got out of line? We got what they call whoopings. What we got, it was, it's, nowadays they call it child abuse. Right. I used to run and call the police on my mother. Really? Yeah, she'd want us to show, okay, everybody stripped. I mean, she wanted you actually to strip out of your clothes and get naked while she would get these ironing cords and tie them up. And she'd go to whooping, and I'd run up in the bathroom, and I'd, then when I knew she wasn't there, I'd creep out and, hello, 911, come and get this woman. She's crazy. She's trying to kill us. Come get her. She's nuts. Then as I grew older, I realized she was only five foot two. So one day, I was like a 13 or something, and she went to get the ironing cores. I'm going to tear you up. I brought you into the world. I'm going to take you out. And I, she went, and I grabbed her. I said, There'll be no more of this. There'll be no more of this. And she just, <laughs> you hate me. And I know I don't hate you, Mama. I love you. But the whooping days are over. Yeah, they're over. I mean, it, it was very abusive, Tom. If, to one hand, I can admit that after doing a lot of therapy and a lot of soul searching. Because we used to have, some of us used to have to go to school and we'd have these horseshoes on us and we'd have to cover ourselves up. And, and um, child uh, services would come see her. And, and uh, she'd light us all in the bed and say, if y'all say anything, I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> and they come and say, are you beating these children? She says, no. Mm -hmm. Those little big eyes. No, I'm not touching them. They're just naughty sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my mother was a tyrant and uh, a wonderful person yeah. at the same time. And I, I love her and I miss her dearly. 
James, I'm glad you called. Thanks for being with us tonight. You're welcome, Tom. Nice to be on the air. Okay, nice good night, James. <laughs> <laughs> Do you stay in touch with anybody you met in prison? Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple guys that I, that I talk to. Um, believe it or not, I mean, when I was in prison, I basically dealt with the guys who were in there for like 15, 17, 20, 25 years. I mean, most of the guys that I met in prison, I'll say 95% of the guys, 90% of the guys that I met in prison, if they came out right now, they could share, I would break bread with them and they would be my homies and my friends for mm -hmm. the rest of life. Uh, they taught me a lot of things when I was in prison. A lot of guys pulled me aside because they knew that uh, prison wasn't for me. They knew that that kind of environment wasn't my kind of environment, which is it's really no one's kind of environment. Right. And a lot of these guys, Tom, they got an incident when they were drunk or they were high. They were defending themselves, and an altercation broke out. And they happened to kill someone by accident, which is the same thing that would happen to you. If somebody jumped on you physically, you would protect yourself. Defend yourself. Well, a lot no of question. these things happen no to question. a lot of these guys. And the unfortunate thing about this is that a lot of these guys have been, these guys that I know that I'm speaking of, and uh, that's for you, Bubba, and, and, um, and, uh, Rob Buns and all the rest of you guys there, that you know, my heart is. Um, a lot of them may never never get out of there, and all they were doing was defending their families or defending themselves. But they taught me a lot. They, t they, they really made me grow up when I was there. Like when you say they taught you stuff. Well, they would pull me aside, and they would be, most of them missed the crack era and, the, and that cocaine type thing. And they would like, they would come to my cell, and they'd like close the door, and they'd sit me down two at a time, and they'd say, look, you know, how the hell can you have millions of dollars, have a beautiful family, have this great career, and end up in here with us? Yeah. Yeah. What do you they know? They say, what explain do you know? this to me. And I, crack, crack. They say, crack. What the hell is crack have to do with you being here right now? You should be out there raising your children. You should be out there helping black kids get ahead. You are black. You, we need role models. We need black men to stand up. And I heard all of this kind of dialogue, and this was an everyday thing. And eventually it started to seep oh, in. I was say, did it sink? Yeah. It sank. Yeah, right? it sank. Yeah, it sank. That I do need to be out there. That crack is causing and dope is causing genocide amongst my people. That my people are, are dying every day. Not only my people, your white people, yellow people, red people. Every, every, every kind every of people. Every day, women are selling their babies because of crack. People are killing and doing uh, uh, gang bangers because of dope. And, and the thing that you have to emphasize is that if you look at, at, at notable people, such as yourself, uh, I can't think of anybody, nor can you, uh, that cocaine has helped. No, you know what? It kicked my ass for many, many, many yeah. years, and trying to explain this to them was like really battering your head up against a, a brick wall because basically they didn't understand the crack thing. I don't know how I got addicted. I don't know why I'm a drug addict, recovering drug addict. I have no idea. All I know is that what I learned in prison, they, they tell you jails, institution, death. Well, God knows I had o OD'd enough times. Mm -hmm. And God knows I had been in enough institutional rehabs. So death was really right at my door. That was my next option. And, and a lot of times it was a wonderful option because a lot of times I actually did drugs hoping to OD and hoping not to wake up. And then after analyzing that, after being straight and sober and analyzing that, saying how could I possibly want not to enjoy this life, have these yeah. beautiful children. Yeah. I have, um, God knows, not many, of black, not many black people come out of the ghetto and all of a sudden from drinking Ripple and drink Crystal and sit on the Tom Snyder show or or deal with, I mean, whatever the case or, is, or, I have a or, responsibility. Or, or become famous and beloved by their fans. Or become famous with all this adulation. Exactly. Sell millions of records and to just want to throw it all away. So like those guys said to you, what are you doing? And I had no answer for them. But they did tell me, well, here's what's happening. We are going to support you while you're here. And we're going to watch your back while you're here. And we're going to teach you everything you need to stand up while you're here. And then we want to see you walk out of here. But don't come back here. Mm -hmm. Don't or, you ever or come else, back here. Or else. Or else. Or else. But by the way, did anybody try to take you on when you were in prison? Anybody try to do me? Yeah. yeah. I mean, physically? Yeah, beat or you up. Or sexually, no, Tom? No, no, beat you up. <laughs> I had one altercation with a, a bald head Russian type Aryan uh, racist in, in a place called CIC. But after I whooped his ass, I didn't have any more problems, you know? <laughs> 
Word does get around, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, everybody know I'm not no punk. You know, number one, I mean, the whole bottom line is I had a blanket of love in prison because I'm real. I mean, if I had walked in prison with this, with some kind of uppity attitude, if I had walked in prison thinking that I was this or I was that, which I have never thought, I have never put myself on any kind of pedestal. If anything, I put myself under a pedestal. The only person, the only spirit on a pedestal in my life is God Almighty. That's it. Every man is the same. You know, you bleed, you cut, you know, I don't, you know, if I'm not about all that bull other, um, if I had went there with a, a funky ass attitude, yeah, I, I would have been, I would have been done. I mean, because there are plenty of guys. I mean, I'm not saying I'm, I'm no, I'm not a uh, Bruce Lee, and I'm not just super Mike right. Tyson, but I mean, I'll fight and I'll defend myself, you know, and that's the bottom line. Ain't nobody taking no butt from me. I mean, Bubba didn't walk in my cell and say, hey, "It's about time, Rick, super freak this." <laughs> no, that didn't happen. Matter of fact, me and Bubba became great friends. <laughs> Let me pause here. We're chatting with uh, Rick James. CD is called Urban Rhapsody. We'll be right back after this break. With Rick James, uh, who's been giving me career advice in the break, here is uh, Steve on the toll-free in Oakville, Ontario. Hi, Steve, and welcome to CBS Late Night. Hello. Hi, Tom. How are you doing? I'm okay, thanks. How about yourself, Steve? Pretty good. Good. I'm, I'm up this late to watch your show. I'm really happy. <laughs> well, thanks. I'm happy, too. You're enjoying yourself tonight, Steve? Oh, excellent. Yeah. How, how many ahead? Oh, about two. Okay. Fair enough. Say no, hi. Here I'm in Ontario, so we're a few hours behind. Okay. Say hi to Rick. He's right here waiting hey, for Hey, Rick. How are you doing? How are you doing? Good. I just wanted to ask you one thing. Uh, how do you find your music when you were around as t compared to today's music? How do I find my music... How do you in find relation your music to in to relation today? to what's going on today? Yeah, to what's going on today. Well, I mean, there's it's 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 um, well, that's what, an cha interesting what question. changed while you were away? You know, not a whole lot. Rap became rap, more right, okay. uh, rap became more uh, uh, rap became a bigger idiom in music, of course. And uh, but basically, when, when I hear the stuff that I did in the '80s, or listen to George or Prince or whatever we were doing in the '80s, I mean, basically, I hear the same things. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really hear much of a change. Uh, other than lyrically, I hear a lot of changes lyrically, and I hear a lot of changes sonically as far as some of the sounds that that uh, that kids are using these days. Yeah. yeah. But funk is still funk, and and, and rock is still rock, and uh, music is still music, and that's but that's is, a common is, is 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 music static right now? Is it is it not going I think, anywhere? I new? think music is stagnated a lot. Yeah. I don't think it's I don't think it's really going a lot of places. I mean, that's just my personal my personal. Well, why don't you take it somewhere? Well, I mean, I plan on the time, but you know, you got to understand that number one, these things take time. Number two, there's a whole lot of young kids out there who, who have to be re. Uh, I just know, love the way you say. Reunited. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Tom, you got to understand. To, Tom, these, yes. these, these things take time, Tom. Rick I mean, you know. Puffy James. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, yeah I mean, yeah, but I, I mean, I'm creating new music all the time, and and, and hopefully. Uh, you know, some of, the, some, of the, some of the kids will get turned on to it and say, yeah, we dig this. Or if not, whatever. I'm not knocking rap, but do you define rap as music? I, I define rap as, as, as yes, as, as, an art, as an art form. Um, some of it I heard isn't very musical at all. But as an art form, yes. I mean, some, well, I, it, it I, is something someone's doing that's creative. But to say musical, there are a lot of great rappers out there who are doing great musical things. Then there are a lot of them out there who are doing not so great musical things. Okay. Then there are a lot of them out there who are just doing what we did, sampling and doing things. So it's very, that's a very thin line to define it. Is it musical? Mm -hmm. Is it art? Yes. Is it good? Yes. Is some of it bad? Yes. Of course. But is it very musical? Hey, that's, that's a hard question. <laughs> yes, it's very musical, Tom. Yes, it's... it's uh, definitely dodged, huh? Definitely Let's talk not. about the master of blend right here. <laughs> yeah. Steve, I'm glad you called. Anything else, young man? Well, I'd just like to ask if he's going to come back as strong as he was before. Stronger than ever, Steve. Oh, uh, great. Okay. Thanks yes, thank nice you, Steve. You. Thanks All right. a lot. Bye. Good night, Steve. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, this autobiography that I mentioned, yeah. is, is that done, or are you still in the process well, basically, of writing it's, it? it's, it's done. Uh, I'm writing it along with a guy named Devin Say. And uh, who's a fine writer? He's written about 15 or 16 books, mostly uh, uh, some autobiographies, but most books about the history of rhythm and blues and stuff. He's very black conscious as far as his awareness on black music and the history of black music. 
and I wrote most of it when I was in prison. So he, he uh, I wrote probably a little more than half of it, and then he uh, sat with me after I had my hip surgery for like three weeks, and we did a tape thing. So we're, ho we're hoping that the book uh, gets published, I don't know, uh, he'll be finished with it by September, so hopefully by 99. Um, it'll be out. Was there anything when you saw it in print where you said, I, I don't want to put this in here. I'm, I'm ashamed of this or this embarrasses me or embarrasses somebody in my family or somebody I know? There were a few things that um, I had to really think about. Did I want people to know? But you know what? After a lot of soul searching and praying on it, um, you know, basically, Tom, my life has been an open secret, you know. I mean, I don't have any qualms about telling, you know, dealing with people, dealing with issues mm -hmm. about my sexuality or uh, my spirituality or whatever ality that I happen to be in or happen to have been in. And there's a lot of things in this book that really hurt to say, you know. There's a lot of things in this book that I'm embarrassed about. There's a lot of things in this book that I'm hurt about. Could you give an example or two? Uh, well, one of the things is when I, when I was in jail with a, after, with a million dollar bail, the day that I got out of jail, I was in jail for about a week and a half before I actually got sentenced on a million dollars. And my old lady was in jail for 750000 So I got out, then I got, and she got out. On the day that uh, I was taking my family to Hawaii, or her family, on the way to Hawaii, on an airplane, I went down to a street and bought some crack. The next day, well, the next day, not the day, the next day, I went down to uh, this street in Hollywood and I brought some crack. And when I brought it, <clears throat> two white guys were in plain clothes, gapped me right there. I was sitting in the car with my old lady. And I had about $80, $90 worth of dope. And I just ate it. And uh, of course, they took us to the police station. And I was very, very, I was scared, you know what I mean? No Hawaii. Well, no Hawaii, but also, I mean, what does this look like? The day after I get out of jail and I got dope on me? And uh, I swallowed it. And uh, they, 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 they jammed us up for like eight hours. When you say you swallowed it, was it inside of a It was wrapped inside yeah. a thing and uh, defecated it out mm -hmm. later on, eight, nine hours later, and smoked it. I mean, that's the junkie's mentality. It's in the book, though, huh? Yeah, it's in the book. Good. I mean, I don't think... <laughs> I want people to understand what drug addiction is about. More than that, I want them to understand what I'm about, you know, what my life's been about. And my life has been like, a lot of my life has been really wonderful, but then a lot of my life has been really dark and very strange, you know. You don't walk that road alone, you know. No, I mean, no, I don't walk it alone. And that's, and, and that's the good thing that I have that there's other people like that particular little story. I mean, there's a, there's a, the book has a lot of stories dealing with people, places, and, and different things and different situations. A lot of it is funny. A lot of it is very sick. But all of it is the truth. The truth, okay. And there, I, may be only, there may be only two or three things that I don't put in the book. And that's only basically for my son. Very good, sir. I'm really glad you came back on this show. I, I admire your work a great deal, and I admire your courage in beating the monkeys on your back a great deal, and it's good to see you again. Well, I'm trying, I'm trying to keep them off there. With the help of God and support, they will be. When the book is done, you'll come back, okay? If, if we're, you don't, I'll be really upset with you, okay. Tom. Okay, well, if, if we're still here, okay. We'll have at least 50 more shows because then it'll be 800 and we get shrimp. <laughs> Every hundredth show we get free shrimp from CBS. Rick James has the new CD out called Urban Rhapsody and the book is still to come called Confessions of a Super Freak, some of which he has done here tonight and for which we thank him. Next, Lisa Michaels and the story of growing up in the 60s and 70s. We'll be right back after this break.